In this section, we're going to be looking at high cell limits and fits and talking about tolerances. Okay, what is a tolerance? First of all, let's talk about that. So, I have some drawings that I did in a previous video. Um, and let's say we have a dimension here, um, which we can see would be 40. Now we're asking someone to manufacture this block and they're gonna to say to you, okay, what is this block used for? And how accurate do you need me to make it? Um, and then, then you say, but why do you need to know that? And then they'll say to you, well, um, if you need it manufactured to uh, maybe plus or minus one millimeter, then I can do the whole thing on, on um, I can basically saw it out and then maybe machine it on a milling machine. And it would be great. It wouldn't go more than one millimeter bigger than 40 and it wouldn't go less than one millimeter. But if you say no, but that, that's going to be a little bit of a risk because maybe when this is assembled onto another part, it's not going to fit if it's that far out, like a 41 millimeter part won't fit. Then they said, okay, well then you're going to have to make it plus minus 0, 0,1 millimeter. That means one tenth of a millimeter. Then then your manufacturing workshop will tell you, well, in that case, we have to change our manufacturing process um, to be more accurate in our machining. And if, if you go even, even more accurate than that, let's say 0 0.01, then they will have to introduce more processes, for example, surface grinding, to get that surface exactly 0 0.01 millimeters, um, bigger or smaller than 40. So the, the, the tighter your tolerances go, um, the more accurate you want the part manufactured, the more expensive it's going to be because the more processes you have to introduce to make sure that it is accurate. So as an engineer, you must always remember that it's not only the, um, the functionality of the part that we're interested in, we're also interested in the cost. We want to make it as cheaply as possible with it still able to perform its function. If this bracket can get away with a one millimeter tolerance, then we do it like that. And we, we manufacture it because it'll be very cheap to manufacture. Um, because tools wear out, machines wear out, so sometimes um, they can't work as, as accurately. But um, if we have a very tight tolerance, then we have to have a new and highly high precision machine to do that. All right, so just keep in mind that when it comes to manufacturing tolerances, um, we always have to be, keep in mind the cost of the part because ultimately it's not possible to make a 40 millimeter dimension part as we see it there. It will always be out. The amount that it's out will just depend on the machine manufacturing it and the accuracy of the gauges that you're using to measure it. So if we use a vernier caliper, we can get it to a fraction, one tenth of a millimeter in measurement. But if we use a micrometer, we can we can measure down to one hundredth of a millimeter or even even more accurately. So um, depending on the accuracy of your measurement device, that will also affect how accurate the part can be manufactured. All right, so that's the basics of tolerances. It's a, it's a balance between how how cheap how cheaply we can manufacture the part and how much accuracy do we need for it to operate effectively now when it comes to something that is that is connecting with another part in an assembly especially when it look when you come to a bearing <clears throat> sometimes we need to design the tolerance or the fit of these two parts a little bit more accurately and there's a standard system that's been developed by the ISO, the International Standards Organization, uh, a standard system for uh, determining whether a shaft running in a hole is going to be a loose fit, a sliding fit, or a tight fit. And as you can see here, very complicated tables of the different fits, but it's not as complicated as you think. Okay, each type of fit has a letter and a number and I'll explain to you exactly how they work um, and there's two tables this fits based on the hole size and this fits based on the shaft size 
All right, so if we go back to our, our first page here. So what are we trying to do? In this case, we've got what we call a journal bearing. And that is a plane bearing or a shaft that's running inside a hole. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter what the material is at this stage, but all we know is that there's a shaft running in the hole. As you can see, as it's drawn over here, we've got the shaft and we've got a gap and then we've got the hole and then we've got the, the hatched section there, which is indicating the tolerance, the upper and the lower tolerance of the hole. We've got the zero line, which would be, let's say it's a 40 millimeter diameter hole and shaft. That would be exactly 40 millimeters. Um, and then the shaft would have this black region, which is the upper and the lower limit of the tolerance of manufacturing of the shaft itself. So if we look on this side, we've got the tolerance zone of the shaft, tolerance zone of the hole. We've got the clearance, the minimum clearance or allowance there, and the maximum clearance or allowance there. If the shaft is made to its minimum size, the bottom of this tolerance, and, and the hole is made to its maximum size, we will end up with a quite a loose shaft in the hole, and that would be the maximum clearance or allowance the condition. That is technically possible. It's a, it's a bit of a random selection. You don't really know which uh, tolerance of shaft is going to end up with which tolerance of hole. It's up to the machines that are making it. If the hole is made to its smallest dimension, which would be this, this size, and the shaft is made to its maximum dimension, which is this size, then you're going to end up with the minimum clearance or allowance. All right, so that is a decision that you have to make as an engineer, is how much of tolerance do you want in the hole and the shaft, and what is your maximum and minimum clearance going to be? All right, uh, we've got an upper deviation and a lower deviation. That's just another name for the, <coughs> for the, the tolerances. Okay, now we come across three different types of fit. So in order to figure out how to, to specify a tolerance, as you can see with these letters and numbers here, we have to decide, first of all, do we want a clearance or a running fit? In other words, the part must, the shaft must run freely and loosely in the hole. Um, so at all times there will be clearance. Even when you're at the smallest hole and the biggest shaft will still have a clearance. The lower, um, the minimum tolerance clearance there will always be a gap. A transition fit or a push fit, this is where there is either a clearance or an interference. An interference is where in some condition your your shaft can be bigger than the hole, so you have to actually press it in. So to, as we talk about very small amounts of um, fractions of a millimeter, so you would be able to press it in, in a transition fit. All right, so a transition fit is designed so that you can assemble them, um, but they're not designed to rotate continuously in operation. They're designed to assemble once and then be fixed together. They cannot turn. A dial and a reamed hole, um, heavy, medium, and light keying fits. Okay, so those are examples. A dial or a little shaft in a hole that's that's designed to to make different parts together. They're not going to rotate, but they are going to be pressed in. The third type of fit is called an interference fit or a press fit. Here, there's always an interference. An interference means that your shaft is always going to be slightly bigger than the hole. The assembly of the mating parts requires pressure and or heat. The tolerance zone of the hole is entirely below that of the shaft. So in other words, this entire tolerance zone here is going to be, even when the shaft is its maximum and the, and the, the shaft is at its minimum, the hole's at its maximum, there's still going to be interference. So in that case, we want to assemble it once and we want it to be as tight as possible. So for example, a shrink fit, <clears throat> where we take the, the whole material, which is like a pulley, we could heat it up, expand the material, we would slide it on the shaft, and then we cool it down, and then it clamps itself. So that would be an example of a shrink fit, or an interference fit. So here you can see um, this illustration is showing you very nicely how 
these will play out. And we can achieve a clearance fit, transition fit or interference fit in two different ways. We can do that by varying the size of the shaft, by making the shaft bigger or smaller to achieve one of those three fits. Or we can do it by keeping the shaft constant and changing the size of the hole. Okay, so that's what we're showing here. So if the hole is constant and the shaft size is changing, it's a hole basis system. The hole stays constant, we vary the shaft diameter to get the fit that we want. If the shaft staying constant but we're varying the hole, then that's called a shaft basis system because the shaft is not changing in diameter. <clears throat> a particular fit requires designated by a symbol made up of numbers and letters. The numbers indicate the tolerance grades and the letters the deviations. Capital letters for holes and small letters for shafts. All right, so if we go back to our tables, we can see the upper table here is on the whole basis. So the whole basis means that the shaft is changing in size. The hole is fixed. Shaft basis means that the shaft stays the same size and the hole is changing. So th this is the deviation of the hole sizes. And this is the deviation of the shaft sizes. All right, so <clears throat> on the whole basis, these are the shafts. So if we look across the top, it becomes a lot simpler. If we, d we just look at the three different categories here, we've got the clearance fit. Over here, all of these fits um, you will have a loose sliding foot where you can have your shaft rotating in the hole. Okay, so everything from here to here, um, and all of these are designated by the letter H, as you can see there, um, for the hole, and you've got, um, you've got Fs for the shaft, or Ds. All right, so everything from here to here is a clearance fit. Everything has a transition fit, so it can press in, but it's not designed to rotate. Interference fit means that it's a very tight fit. All right, so <clears throat> going down the column here, we've got the sizes of your hole and shaft. So let's say we've got a 50 millimeter shaft. So here we've, we go down the table on this side, um, we want to keep the hole constant and we want to vary the shaft size. So let's take this, this one over here, we go across and we decide we want a transition fit. So we could go here and we could say, okay, we want quite a loose transition fit. So we choose the first two. So this tolerance for a loose transition fit on a 50 millimeter shaft would be H7K6. On our drawing, we would just indicate with a, um, a call out description with an arrow pointing to the shaft at a particular point, then we would say um, transition fit H7, K6. It's up to the manufacturer to then go to this table and go down the shaft and uh, the whole size and transition fits and see, okay, for this, we can go plus 30 uh, microns, z minus zero, and we can go plus 21, plus two, for the shaft. So that's the hole and that's the shaft. All right, so that is how this table works. It's not as complicated as it thinks, as you might think. We're talking about, in summary, we're talking about three different types of fits of a shaft in a hole, a clearance, a transition, or an interference. We decide which one we want. Let's say we want a clearance fit. Then we have to decide, is it easier to change or to vary the size of the shaft or the hole. Let's say it's easier to change the size of the shaft because the hole is part of a cast iron um, cylinder block of an engine. So we want we want to we can easily machine the shaft. So we decide we want a clearance fit and we want it on a shaft basis. Um, so we go to the shaft basis table, we've got clearance fits and we say we want it looser, we want it tighter. So if we go in the middle here, we can select, let's say it's a 100 millimeter shaft. We go across here in the middle and we'll get an H7 and F8. Then the manufacturers would know to, to go, their tolerance in manufacturing the hole would be plus zero minus 35 for the shaft would be plus 90 
and plus 36. And that is how you select your limits and your fits for um, according to the ISO system. How do we indicate this on our drawing? And there's three different basic ways to do this. Um, there is the, um, the plus minus dimension, which gives you a geometric value, um, which is symmetrical. So here we've got a four plus minus 0 0.01. <clears throat> and that would be indicating you can go either 0 0.01 millimeters bigger or smaller. Um, the, the other way to do it is to indicate the, the limits. As you can see here, there you've got the 50, uh, 0.025 and the 50,000. So you put the two dimensions on to give the upper and the lower limit. And the other way we can do it is to put the nominal value and then put an upper limit and a lower limit. So here we've got a lower limit of zero, an upper limit of plus 0 0.089. So those are the three basic ways that we can dimension tolerances. In addition to that, it's important to put a general tolerance on the bottom of your drawing in the title block. This tells your manufacturer that unless specified on a particular position on the drawing, on the part, everything can be manufactured to the same tolerance. So it just makes life a lot easier for you as the engineer, the designer, as well as for the manufacturer to know what to do. All right. This is a very interesting section talking about tolerance stack up. Now, <clears throat> that is just illustrating how important it is to dimension from a datum line. If you're dimensioning from a datum line, but each dimension um, dimensions from the previous dimension. So there's four plus minus zero point one. From there, we're measuring another four plus minus zero point one. The total tolerance from a datum line from here to there would be the, the addition of all the tolerances. So it'd be zero point zero two. So there is a stack up of the tolerances if you do it this way. It's a better practice to dimension from a single point so that each position will be constrained by its own tolerance and not by the tolerances of all the dimensions before it. The same is true for uh, dimensioning uh, linear dimensions as well as position dimensions. All right. So that is a little discussion on tolerancing and dimensioning and how important it is to select the right tolerances. Remember that we want to make our parts as efficient um, and, and cost effective as possible. So we want to keep the tolerances <clears throat> as big as we can, um, but still allow the, the part to be manufactured accurately and to function correctly so that we don't get ourselves into a problem where we have tolerance stack ups causing the parts to, to fail in some way and be too inaccurate. And that is all for this section.